Welcome to the day three, second session, where we delve a little bit deeper into bringing the sale together and talking about your commission. So these are two important topics because if you do it wrong, the whole, the whole transaction will fall apart at that point. So at the end of the day, you want to get a, an offer to purchase from a seller, signed off and sealed, and you also want to obviously get the maximum amount of commission uh, that's due to you. And I'm going to share some perspectives there today. But before we move on, I want to quickly look, and Andres asked me earlier on, how do we bring together the 16 personalities? That's your main screen right now. So if those that are listening, if you actually went online, it's a free personality test. It's called the 16 personalities. And there's a specific reason why I like you to do that, because most of, the, most of our lives, we've gone, we've gone around not really knowing who we are, uh, both externally, but also internally. And our surroundings are determined by the input and the stimulation we get from outside. When you're in real estate, you are engaging the public. And here's the thing, you need to understand yourself first before you can understand your potential buyers and your sellers. So we're going into a world kind of blind and not really knowing what, um, what to say, what to do, or why we feel certain things. And this little, I, I, I'm not an expert in this, but I, I, I've used it for recruiting. I've used this in workshops. There are simpler versions, but this one is, is free, which I like. And it's, it's based on the Maya Briggs uh, 16 personality test. And you will see that after answering those questions, it will categorize you okay, into a certain category. And as an, as an agent, if you look at the top left, your dominant personality, and I hope you've all done it because then you'll understand what I'm saying. You're either an introvert or an extrovert. Now, that is just what the public perceive, um, not just what the public perceive, but also what you sense inside. Now, these personality tests do not define whether you're going to be successful in real estate or not. In fact, anyone can be successful in real estate if you learn the, the skills that are required to be successful in real estate. And we've often found, and this is what I found with especially the younger teams, we found that our extroverts don't have problems prospecting, but they talk too much. So they've got to be trained to be more intuitive, to perceive more, to be more aware of their, of their surroundings. We find that the introverts tend to want to focus on the marketing side. They want to avoid um, as much as possible confrontation with people. Once they get the skills, the introvert becomes a very proficient, well-structured, well-organized prospector. The extrovert on the other side, the moment he learns that it's not all about him or that he needs to learn to be quieter, he becomes an excellent prospector too. So the reason I ask you to do this is for you to identify what is your dominant uh, personality type. Are you an extrovert or an introvert? And then you will see that there will be three different letters after the E or the I. And that is, are, are, you, a, are you a sensory person? And those 15 or 20 questions that you answer basically give you tremendous insight. Are you realistic? Do you focus on facts or details? Um, are you intuitive? So you're either an S or an I. Uh, are you a thinker? You tend to make uh, decisions logically. Uh, you analyze your objective. Normally, a T and an S will go together. Uh, are you a feeler? Do you run your gut feel? Um, uh, do people offend you easily? Do you walk into a situation? Um, Pumliza, you said that those clients really like you. Um, I, I'm, a, uh, I'm a perceiver, so I, I think that he's probably flattering you. You probably think that he really likes you. It's just a difference of opinion based on who we are intrinsically. Um, the other part of you could be, are you a judge, a judger, or you are a perceiver? So you can see they actually categorize you can be one or the other, but you will be in all four categories. And the reason I showed you this, as a, firstly, as a fun exercise, but the importance of it is you need to understand yourself uh, in order to be able to, to understand how you're going to react and respond to the market. And, um, and if, there's, if there's, if, for example, you're an introvert, there's certain skills and certain mindsets that you have to have in order to overcome that introversion. If you're an extrovert dominantly, you tend to be like a bull in a china shop. You overconfident. You meet a client that's now an introvert, and so you, 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 you overshadow them with your extroversion. And the idea behind understanding yourself is to make you understand that out there are people that are different to you. And a really good agent, um, a really good salesperson, will be able to read the room adjust himself to that type of personality and, and, and then able to communicate, converse, and reach the same conclusions. So at the end of the day, the objectives remain the same. 
the, the road you take based on your personality type and the client that you're with is personality type. That, that you need to master. So I've given you this um, as a as a almost as a lollipop for you to understand that this is this is nice to know who I am. I did this with my wife, 30 years of marriage, still struggling to understand her. Two years ago, we did this, and suddenly I realized that my wife, this is where my wife is. I can't change it, but I can leverage off that. My wife is a thinker, she's a judger, and she's highly intuitive. I'm, I'm all the opposites of those. And so, so somewhere down the line, 30 years into marriage, we're finding ourselves sort of almost, almost arm wrestling one another over issues. And once I understood that she's both a perceiver and a thinker, she's the research person. If I say anything, she's on Google and she's checking me out. So I've learned that if I want something done or I want to know something, I'm not really that detail orientated. I will ask Amanda, my wife, I'll ask her a question. And you know what she does? She goes into the internet. She comes back to me. The other day, we were talking about high blood pressure. Came back to me with 20 YouTube videos. Why, why somebody has high blood pressure, how to overcome it naturally. So if we can learn who we are, we can understand who others are, we can actually leverage those strong traits to our advantage and to their advantage. So I'm a lot more patient with her now. I understand that she's going to research everything I say, question everything I say, and that's okay. So that's the reason I, I, I brought this together. As an agent, you need to know firstly who you are, understand that there's a world of people out there. Uh, you can start with your wife and your kids. My kids are adults. I did this with them as well. And my daughter, who's high on the introversion um, spectrum, uh, she, she, she's, there's only a few percent of the people in the world have that sort of personality type. If you met my child, you would not know she's an introvert. However, she, because she's learned that this is what will hold her back, and she's overcome that by, by adjusting. And, in a, and depending on the situation, she'll make the adjustment. And we as agents, when you walk into a certain scenario – um, or a certain home, and the personalities are different, you make that adjustment and you try and meet them where they're at. That's where they're going to respond to you. So that's just on the personality side, because we're in a contact sport. It doesn't matter if you're introvert or extrovert. You, you need to understand who you are, understand that there are differences out there. How do we match those? So that was why I gave you that. And I think it's a very um, it's a very interesting exercise. You've done it properly. Remember to give them your email address, and they will once a month, they will send you for free. They will send you updates on your personality. Your love life, the way you respond to conflict, um, why you procrastinate, all these little short things. And so I've been going for nearly four years with this. Um, in many cases, I've used parts of this for my CV. And it also helps me if I apply for specific positions um, that, that I can instantly know if this is what it requires of me. I'm not suited for it because of this type of personality. So what I'm doing today with you guys is very much in line with what I enjoy doing. Um, is, is helping people communicating and taking difficult subjects and making it easy. So, so I'm in my, I'm in my uh, groove today, if I could say that. If I were sitting behind a desk now counting numbers, it would drive me mad. Okay. So just to, just to say you are, you are who you are and that's okay, but know that there are differences out there and, and maybe don't overpower people. Let them come to you and meet them where they're at. Okay. So bringing us to the end of the session and, and Dave, my, <laughs> objective is to finish it at just after 11, so I'm going to go rather fast through this. Again, whatever you miss, I'm going to give David access to all the slides, so you're going to be able to work through this over time, and, and he can either give them all to you, or you can take them piece by piece. Um, but at the end of the day, we have now we have a plan, we've been prospecting, we've been learning how to price counsel, we've been learning how to close, ask open-ended questions, now we're closing. We've closed the buyer. The buyer has agreed that he wants to put in a specific offer. And by the way, this is a whole day's topic. So I'm going to just bring it down to the essence in the, in the next half an hour as to what I feel is most important about understanding the close. But this, this you must understand up front. Close, you must. And this, as we said, always be closing. You need to constantly look for those signals, those emotional uh, signals that happen out there, and you should be closing all the time, both to get clarity, confirmation, ultimately get a decision. So the final close is we're going to assume now that the buyer has agreed that he wants to put an offer in. And as I've often said, as I said to you before, if someone says to me, what price will the seller accept? I always say, I've got a 100% guarantee they'll accept full price. Um, if they come to me and they say, will they accept a lower offer? My next response is usually to them, I'll have to find out because remember, I'm, I'm impartial. I cannot take a sign. Do not give them intel as to what their offers may be on the table. 
Um, at the same time, I tell them I will find out for you if that offer. At the same time, I also so I don't waste time. I'm a hard closer. I ask them, is this your best offer? Because the, the danger is if you're going in low, it rejects it and somebody else comes in between, you might just lose a sale. So I often encourage people, give me your highest possible offer that you want. So if my client accepts it, it's a go. If he rejects it, then 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 I don't have to bother you or badger you. Okay. So I want I want clarity. I don't want them to play this. I'll go low, try to get high, meet you in the middle. I'm too old for that. Um, and I've been in the game too long to, to play that. I've played that for many years. But as you new agents learn, some of the keys are just get the maximum price out of them, present it to your seller. Um, there are two schools of thought out there when you come into a close. Um, the old school of thought is write the offer, get, get the buyer to commit uh, to paper, which, which I 100% agree with, and take it to your seller. Then, of course, you've got to counsel your seller. You've got to show them uh, details about the buyer, why, why they can only afford that. But you must be absolutely fat. Um, and then you try and close the close the seller. The danger with that is when offers are very low and the buyer has no other alternative, the, the seller tends to want to make up the difference. So, and, and Lee, you've got to really stand strong and you've got to show your work and how to do that. The other side of the coin is, and I, I do this often, much to the horror of my managers, um, but if, if you give me an offer today and say, listen, we, we, the highest possible offer we can go is 2.1 million, um, but the house is on for 2.3 million. I said, thank you so much. I just search your highest. They said, it's our absolute highest. I said, I'll tell you what, I'll get back to you later. I go back and I process it and I look at all the facts and then I call the seller. Now, remember, I know by now that my buyer is qualified. I know that he's got a half a million deposit. I know that he can move in in, in 60 days time. Um, and I know that they, they, they look in, that, that they, they're serious buyers because they, they want to get the kids. January. So I have all the facts with me and now I have a number and I know that that's the highest possible number that they'll go. I process that. I don't just pick up the phone and call the seller, but then I'll phone the seller. I'll say, Mr. Seller, I received an offer. I wonder if I could talk, talk you through it um, before I commit it to paper because I don't want you to commit to paper and then I'm, I'm arm wrestling the seller. That's usually where our relationships go south. So that is another way to do it. I have a very specific way. I want the, the, the buyer to be under a little bit of pressure while he's waiting. And I want the seller to be to have the opportunity to process it because once I know he commits, you'll commit. And then I'll and then I will sell him why this is the best buyer or why he should consider it. I've got all the facts. And I'll show you that as we go through this slides. So we bring in the sale together. You won't get paid until you close the sale and you and you've got consent from both the buyer, the seller, and the bank. So this is where we, this whole three-day conference is, is leading to this point. And then I'm going to close with the commission. All your hard work will pay off when you get your qualified buyers to complete an offer to purchase. And obviously, the next step is that when you get your qualified seller to accept the offer to purchase. And this is probably one of the areas that requires the most skill. Any agent can take a low offer and present it. It's very difficult to take a correct offer and present it. And that, that often takes skill. But again, as I said, I really simplified the process. I don't waste time with buyers that are ridiculous. However, I always, and you have to, always acknowledge their offer. Um, ideally, you want to put it on paper, but in my life, in my pace, to spend two hours on a really low offer that may or may not be accepted, I'd rather first communicate that with the, the seller, get his consent, write the offer. And you know what? If you get consent between a, a buyer's price offered, and a seller's agreement on the price. You know what you can do, ladies and gentlemen? I've done this not once, but at least a dozen times. I can put them around the same table. I have them both come at four o'clock in the afternoon. Everything's out in the open. The occupational date is sorted out. The deposit is sorted out. Um, the price is sorted out. The fittings and fixtures are sorted out. The declaration is sorted out. I can put them on opposite sides of a table, sit in the middle, and I can conclude the whole transaction within half an hour to an hour with a cup of coffee. Why? Because I've, I've, I've brought a willing buyer to a willing seller. I've negotiated verbally the, the agreements and terms before them, so there's no dispute. I, I, I don't know about that in all cultures. It, it works where we work. Um, so it's just one of the things that, that, that I, I use to save time. And then obviously I know when I walk out of there, the buyer's asked about the curtains. The seller the seller's said he's taking his water pump or his Jojo tank. That's all cleared at that table. It's not these 25 phone calls and discover when it, when it registers that those things were missing. I prefer a transparent, open relationship. Why? Because I haven't lied through the process. 
The price has been uh, market related, and all I've got to do is, is get consent from both of them to accept whatever their decisions are regarding their expectation. Really can be that simple. All right. So we're at this point now. There are some there are some clues along the way when you when you're closing the buyer and you're closing the seller. Um, there, these I'm going to give you six sentences that, that really make my that make me blush. And these are words I love to hear. And the first one is this: is when I'm closing a buyer and and I know that he's given me a price and it's his highest possible offer, I'll say to him, Mister Buyer, if the seller accepts your offer, when would you like to move in? That's a closing question because now I'm working on the occupation day. My assumption here is that the, and I always assume the positive, <coughs> the seller will accept and therefore we need an occupation date. We may not agree on the contract uh, according to the seller on the occupation date, but I'm wanting to make sure the buyer is committed. So he says to me, I said, if the seller accepts your offer, when would you like to move in? He says, yeah, ideally we'd like to move in on the 30th of July because we're moving down and our, and our flat in. I know that, and suddenly I realize there's a commitment from him, which also makes me realize if there was a little bit of haggle on the price, because he's already committed to me, he's probably a little more flexible than he's willing to let me know. So I use a closing question to see his commitment. At this point, I'm going for close. I want to put my kids, I want to pay my kids varsity fees off at the end of the year. I've got commitments and bills. I'm moving towards the close. And then whatever they ask me, I never have a yes or no. I always say, let me find out for you. I never speak on behalf of the seller whether he's going to let the Jojo tanks go or he's going to drop his price. I always say, let me find out for you. And that works both ways. So that means I've got a positive question and they're looking for an answer. And sometimes you've got to find, you, you, you've got to find the middle ground on those questions. Um, what would you like me to do? That's the other thing. Let me find out for you. I had, don't have an answer. And what would you like me to do? In other words, um, Lee, I want to put in an offer. I want to put it in, the, in at this price. I would like to move in on this specific day. My question is this. So what would you like me to do? Obviously, my response is, would you like me to write the offer now? And obviously, if he's really close to the mark, I'm going to write the offer. I'm not going to, I'm not still going to verbally communicate it. But if he's going to do it at five o'clock in the evening, I'm going to talk to the seller in the meantime. and say, I'm bringing an offer. I'm, I'm not sure what it is yet, but could I meet with you an hour later? I'm writing the offer at five. Could I see you at about 6.30? Um, and those are those are three beautiful phrases I use often and as much as I want to. The other the other one um, is if is that offer that um, is that the offer you would like me to present to the seller? Again, I'm looking for commitment. The guy's given me a price, and I say, is that the offer you want to present? He says, yes, I will go and present it. I will normally say to the guys, I'm going to confer with my client first. I like to do it verbally, and then close the seller. And then put it together. And then I normally come back. And guys, and this is something I've been using for 20 years. It gets better and easier. Let's say there's a difference in price. Remember, you don't have to cut commission because there's a difference in price. Your willing buyer has come in at his, I made an offer 90000 short of, of the asking price. For some reason, that's what buyers like to do. And they're conditioned to do that. Everyone's looking for a bargain. You communicate with your seller. And your seller says, I won't accept it. So there's, if he doesn't accept it, there's no offer. And then I ask the question, would you like a counter offer? He says, look, Lee, I will drop my price by 50000 but I'm not dropping it by 90000 And those are the exact words that I go back and I tell the buyer. I say, Mr. Buyer, thank you for your offer. My, my seller is really excited. He's committed to selling this home. He liked you. But on the issue of price, he is willing to come down by 50000 but not 90000 so now for the buyer, and that can be any amount, by the way. Um, I often draw it out of my seller. What 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 kind of offer would you like to make? That could be a two hundred thousand difference, but the but the offer might have been five hundred thousand difference. Whatever it is, I always make out as if I'm doing buyer a favor. The yes, I I, I can drop you by fifty, but not by ninety. The difference is forty thousand. Those words exactly like that often convince the buyer that, in a sense, he wanted a slightly lower price. He's a, he's a little bit flexible. He feels he's got that right. It's not quite what he wanted, but he's happy to go ahead. He's still got his difference. There are going to be times when there's going to be no difference, when you're going to say to your client, look, my seller's not prepared to drop his price, um, but he will throw the lawnmower in. You know, always make it, always end on a sweet note. So that word there, the seller's willing to drop his asking price, but not buy. Those, if you can learn that and dream that and use that, it will save you hours and hours of time. Now I can go back to the seller and say, listen, 
thank you so much. He has accepted the drop. When can I write the offer? He knows he's 40,000 less, um, and the buyer knows he's, he's 50,000 less as well. Okay, or 50,000 saved. Absolutely, let's do it. And then again, I always ask the question, what would you like me to do? The reason I ask that, ladies and gentlemen, is you need permission to take the next step. Remember, you've got a buyer and a seller. I always ask permission. Why? Because it takes the responsibility away. It makes me responsible for doing what they want me to do, but I want them to instruct me. Same when it came to that pricing, when you had that card game. It's not for you to force that paper or his price into one between the cards. You, you step back and you ask him, what would you, what would you like him to do? Where do you want to position yourself? You ask the questions, they take responsibility. Would you like me to write the offer? Yes, I'd like you to write me the offer. Am I going to write it at this specific price? Yes, please write it. When the, when the seller says to me, I won't accept that price, I said, him, what would you like me to do? Do you want me to counter offer or do you want me to reject it? What do you want me to do? Because I need clarity all the way. I'm not going to go into some form of ambiguous selling where the seller's not fully informed and the buyer's not fully informed and I'm playing this magic trick between the two of them. Those things always backfire. So one way to, to avert um, something ugly from happening is always to get the permission from the buyer and the seller to do the next step. All right. Those are, those are powerful things that I use personally and they've worked for me over and over. But that difference of price, making it out that I'll drop the price, but not so much that you're still getting the discount. Very, very powerful. That is my strongest and best closing technique that I've, I've developed. So. Right. And then what if you're going to be uh, keys to closing the sale legally, this David takes care of, this you all know. I just thought I'd highlight it. Agents must have a working knowledge of the offer to purchase. Ladies and gentlemen, this is probably the most important document in the process. You cannot leave blanks. You cannot, you cannot make amendments without initials. Um, you need to understand the content of your OTP. You need to know what, what, what um, every single clause, uh, because they, they are, they are, um, they, they are standalone cl clauses, which make up the whole of the contract. You need to be doing OTP training. I think Ulrich from, from the, the attorney company, they should be providing you with training. They should be providing you with training. And it's so important because that's the make or break. Because if there's something missing that delays the transaction, if there's something missing, like all we spoke about the different marriages, um, who's consenting, who's signing, we're married, not married, whose house is in, those things are absolutely important to closing. You must have a working knowledge to offer to purchase. You must be compliant with your FICA, your PPRA, your SARS, and your POPI requirements, and all the others. You have to be, you can't write uh, uh, the sale of a property on a cigarette box anymore as they did 100 years ago. Candidate agents must have a registered mentor present. I know that there's different structures where the mentor can be online um, or is on speakerphone, but you need to have a mentor present in those agreements. Otherwise, what could happen is if, it, if, if there was a problem and the seller goes back and says, um, the agent was with me and the, the first thing the attorney is going to ask was the candidate agent. Yes, it was a candidate agent. You, what, what, was there any representation from an office manager or another sales manager or another salesperson, a registered person? He says, no, basically that transaction you is null and void. It will continue, but they're not obliged to give you. Make sure that you've done, because you've done all the hard work, that you that you legally comply every step of the way. Candidate agents, this is interesting. By the code of conduct says that you must declare uh, your PPRA status. If you're a candidate, don't pretend to be a full status. Okay. Obviously, the other way around would never happen. Agents should have all the necessary OTP documents with them. Guys, this needs to be in your folder, in your car, in your cubbyhole, whatever you do. Always have an offer to purchase the latest version, your company's latest version, online. You never know when, when someone's going to want to sign that OTP. My mother-in-law, who's an estate agent in Pretoria, we often laughed at her because she'll sign the client a buyer up on the bonnet of her car. Uh, the guy says he wants to, wants to buy. She doesn't wait to go to the office. She signs him on her bonnet. She always has an OTP ready. Always have yours ready. And obviously all those, you need to have your declarations with you that the seller has completed. You need to have your fittings and fixtures with you that the seller has completed. Those things need to be with you. Always go into every transaction, the knowledge or the or the position that you're going to sell this problem. Just a matter of time. So always be ready. Number six, agents should be in the possession of a PPRA certificate to receive commission. In other words, you must you must be registered with the, the old EAB or the PPRA. You must, you must be registered. You must have a, a, a fidelity fund certificate number in order to receive commission and negotiate the agreement. Anything apart from that is actually illegal. And we had a, we had a case with one of our agencies, um, top agents, they had moved from their agency to us. And there was this, obviously, like the, the 
that is GFS board had had held up the FFC certificate. They did a transaction. The, 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 the seller got wind of this. Um, he wasn't a friend of theirs. He was just, he was referred. He got wind of this. He questioned it and they had to forego their commission, not because they, 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 they weren't a, a proper estate agent, but because at that moment in time, they didn't have an FFC and it was hanging. Luckily for us, we were able to prove that there was an FFC, that payments had been made and we were able to reverse that. But I'm hearing more and more cases where agents are trading without FFCs and they're handing out maybe to someone with an FFC. And if, if the seller gets wind of that or the buyer gets wind of that, they're not obliged to pay commission. All agents must comply with the PPR code of conduct. So obviously after all this work, after all your effort, you want to make sure that you can close this deal both legally and that you'll be rewarded for, for being legal. Very, very important. And then what information should you have to close? So you're going to see the buyer. The offer might be a slightly off. He says, come and see me. You want to go in there with facts and evidence why this offer is a good offer. Again, you're not there to manipulate or to coerce. You're there to guide and to get, a, get an opinion and ultimately go for the close. So it's very important that you take maybe a recent CMA with you. Um, property might have been on the market for two, four, five, six months. Things have changed. And you just, you just want evidence supporting the fact that the price that he got is in fact in line with the market. Again, you're not going to show him that, that magic price on the CMA because it's flawed. And it might just be higher than what he's got and he thinks you're doing him in. Also might be considerably lower than what he's got, in which case he might find that uh, he's not happy either way. So you're going to, but you want, you want evidence to prove that the price that, this, that the buyer's giving is in fact suited. And in fact, sometimes you're going to realize that the price that the buyer's giving is not suited when you actually present the evidence and you'll both reach that conclusion together. But that's very rare. A recent CMA and recent competing sales. So Mr. Silo, yes, we got you the 2.1 million. Um, I know it's 2.3 million property, but if I can just show you what's happened in the last two weeks is all those properties that were 2.4 and 2.3, they've all dropped their prices to 2.1. So basically the price that he's offering is what he could pay or get for another house um, if he was willing to go see them. Right now he's qualified, he can move out, he's got a deposit. I'm very certain that this is the strongest deal under the current system. Why you want this information? Again, just as you prepared for your listing presentation, I want to encourage you to prepare for your for your closing presentation for that contract. Uh, don't deal in feelings at this point. This is where you deal in facts. Um, seller feedback reports uh, over the mandate period. This is perhaps, and I've got three little stars there. This is easy to my, the reason people pay us commission. One of the biggest challenges we have in the industry today is we list a house. That's why I don't like these open mandates with lead homes and that, uh, because it's very hard to give them feedback, although you, although you can. Now, we have a system in place where every time we do a viewing, we'll, we will phone the client and give him feedback immediately. We don't, we don't wait for another day. We call Friday's feedback Friday. So everything that's happened in the week, we've adjusted the price. We've, we've, we've created a featured ad. Everything we do for the seller in order to sell his home. So we promised him in the beginning and now we're doing it and now we're showing him that we're in fact doing it. That's what we call feedback. Even, and this, this was something I struggled with. I felt if you got no hits and no leads and nobody called, that's, that's a terrible scenario. So there you don't want to call the client. You need to give your client feedback. What happened in the last appointment? Well, Mrs. Jones didn't like the blue room and, and she doesn't really want to pull. That's on me because I should have found out that she didn't want to pull, but I took her to a house with a pool. My mistake. Now, I know what Mrs. Jones wants, but unfortunately, I've wasted my seller's time. The feedback is absolutely important. And, I, and the reason I say it's absolutely important is this is the reason the amount of feedback you give them is the justification for what they're going to pay you. So if you've got no feedback, that client feels as though he's just paying something, but he never really saw the effort. You have to highlight your efforts all along the way. That's why every viewing give feedback. Every Friday give feedback on the marketing. Every, every Monday, tell him what you're going to be doing. You want, him, you want him to know that you are working for your money. So when the day comes when you have to sign this contract, He's not going to question your permission or, the, or, or whether you're worth anything. So you first got to know what your worth is, and then you've got to provide that worth. We, and, and I'll show you when I deal with the commission how important it is third of, of what you do is what you earn. And we often don't get paid right because we've flown in, we've walked with the buyer, he's gone through the house, and those are the lucky ones. Now the client only wants to pay us 3 and a half or 2% because he didn't see any effort. That's why I don't like to work on, the, on open mandates because you get lucky sometimes but you often get low comps and that to me is not lucky. This is a mandate you get to prove your worth by giving feedback to your clients 
managing his profile, market, um, uh, finding out what's happening in the market and getting that feedback to him. So when he comes to you, have to pay you, he realizes, man, maybe I'm even underpaid. My daddy didn't ask for 6%, but I'm willing to pay him his 5%. He doesn't see value. He won't see, he won't see why the commitment could be that high. And that's the most important thing. And of course, you need to know knowledge of the buyer situation. That comes from your opening the questions. That comes with your close of your buyer by the time you get to contract. You need to know the length of time that you spend looking for a property. You need to know any previous attempts to purchase. You need to know his financial approval and his wants and needs. You need to have an in-depth knowledge of your buyer. So when you're sitting with your seller, you can, you can almost uh, present a case of why the buyer is suited for the property. Very, very important. Don't just bail in there with a, with a number and a date. Um, it's very hard to, to, to make a case then the seller resists your offer. And of course, you need to have knowledge of your seller's situation, the length of time in the market, the motivation to meet your clients, and any previous offers. <clears throat> if you have an exclusive mandate, this is easy. If you have an open mandate, you have to ask the seller, you need to know that, you need to know that you're connected with him back and you've got his interest. So, so that's the information that you need to close. Very simple, just four specific things you need to have with you. So again, like your listing presentation, you need to prepare for your closing presentation. All right. The keys to closing the sale, the, the sale, and this is both when you're looking at the buyer and the seller, you need to stay completely impartial. You can't take a side. Although you are representing the seller, you cannot give intel on, on the seller's um, personal finances or circumstances to the buyer, and you cannot give um, information about the buyer to the seller as much as you'd like to. If you're, if you're on the extrovert side, you kind of want to talk about everything because everything's okay. Be very careful of what you say, especially in terms of the Poppy Act, especially in terms of giving away crucial information that might um, be used against the buyer or the seller to manipulate the price. Remain impartial. You're a facilitator. You're a marketer. Um, and, you, and, you, and you're not the judge in the situation. Your job to bring your willing buyer and your willing seller to a, to a conclusion that they're both happy to accept. And we spoke about that. Number two is facilitate the agreement, don't manipulate it. If you're untrained and unskilled, your natural, your natural tendency is, is, to, is to want to manipulate, um, but your gut feel says you don't, but you, you find in this situation it's a, it's, a, it's a lady that's desperate, she's poor, she's not very knowledgeable, she hasn't got a good education, and she's easy to manipulate. Those are the things that you've got to you've got to guard your own integrity that you don't need with both parties in the best possible manner. So you there to facilitate. If you take control, you may you must take responsibility. Sometimes an agent starts to talk out of turn and he's and he's making assumptions on both behalf of the buyer, he's making assumptions on behalf of the seller. Those, by the way, are very dangerous places to move the moment you make an assumption on, on behalf of the buyer or the seller, you're actually you're actually perpetuating a potential lie a potential mistake. So be careful that, especially if you're an extrovert, you want to take control of the situation. Introverts tend to be led, but again, take control, but lead. Um, but if you be careful that you, forget, you don't forget your role as a facilitator, take control, you must take responsibility. Uh, preempt any objections by preparing your responses. So that you can normally sit with your manager or another colleague and say, listen, I think my, my, my seller is going gonna, to gonna, gonna have a resistance maybe to the price or maybe to the time, time uh, frame of moving out. Um, I don't think it can move out in a month. You need to preempt those things. But remember, if, you're, if your buyer needs to be in uh, earlier and your seller can agree, you, you're making the seller an offer. The seller might say, listen, I'll, I'll accept the price, but I can't accept the date. I need two months to wrap up and pack up and, and get out of here. And then, of course, that becomes one of the criteria by which you're going to go to. Buy with, and so you facilitate, facilitate, facilitate. Preempt any objections. I find that if I put everything on paper and I think about it before I see the buyer, I'm obviously more prepared. And, I, and, and funny enough, alternatives do come to me. I can put my suggestions in. But again, suggestions, only that. Don't bring your opinions or judgments to the close. Only facts as you might be proved wrong. So again, be careful of your opinions or judgments or assumptions. Very dangerous part to be when you're closing a transaction. This is a legal transaction. Money is going to be transferred. And any, anything that you might have said um, without thinking or any, any commitments that you make, like often guys say, no, 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 we'll, the, the, the seller will have that blue room painted. And then what happens on the day of, of registration? You never told this to the seller. You've, you, you avoided it either because you knew right from the start he wasn't going to do it. You assumed that he would do it. Now registration takes place, occupation takes place, 
and the blue room is still there. What have you got now? You've got a difficult buyer who suddenly lost um, respect for you. So you're either going to have to pay for it yourself, but now your commission is only three days later. Um, you've got this. You've got the situation. Be very careful. And again, I'm giving you clues here based on my experience that I've had to that I've had to work into my own uh, closing sequence. Don't underestimate the power of silence. When a client's million over a price, or it's a it's a difficult situation. Again, be careful, especially if you're an extrovert. Don't assume that uh, or make an assumption on behalf of him. Client says, "Look, I'm not leaving the JoJo. I put us. I made it very clear on the." Uh, on the fitness and fixtures list, I'm not leaving my JoJo tank. I'm taking it with me. And you've told us, you've told the buyer that possibly is going to leave it. At that point, if you say to the seller, "Look, um, is it worth losing the transaction for the sake of the JoJo?" Then be quiet. Don't give him suggestions. Let him process it because one of two things are going to happen. He's going to say, "You know what, Lee? I thought about it. Chats my wife. You can have the JoJo. Excellent, but it would only happen in silence." Always going to say, you know, I really thought about it. I'm not prepared. I'm not prepared to let the go. So my, my, my original decision stands. That's what you've got to work with. You can't go back now and, and play and play a different game. Work with what they're giving you. But those are the moments when people are processing something that's maybe uh, difficult to understand. Let them process it. You cannot process that for them. Never become desperate to close. And uh, if you're desperate to close, you're going to cut your comp. And that's what uh, that's what these these low comp companies are doing is they they're desperate because they're not closing so they so their comms have to be low and that's the only way that they so again ladies and gentlemen when you go into the close situation these this is very important this is the emotional side of closing with a buyer and a seller remain impartial be a facilitator look for the objection don't offer too many opinions or judgments um, always explain the options and possible consequences. Mr. Thiller, just if you list number six, if you don't accept the offer, then one of two things are going to happen. The offer is then no longer uh, valid, or alternatively, give me a, a, a counter offer, but then the contract's still not valid until the buyer actually accepts it. You want me to do same possible options and possible That's your job. This slide you might want to, you might want to keep in your file um, as, a, as a reminder of. of and of course, I've always spoken about consultative selling. It requires skill and practice, but it's the easiest and most effective way to take a successful win. win. So you're consulting with the buyer, consulting with the seller, always putting their, their, their interests at heart, not your pocket first. You are the, are the third win. Once you find a willing buyer and a willing seller at an agreeable market price, um, all three parties will win. You can only do this if you're asking questions, if you've got the interest of both. Um, and you know that ultimately, when I walk away from this, and this is and this is the litmus test, or this is the test that you need to ask yourself. If I walk away from this transaction, will I be able to go visit the buyer or the seller and have coffee with them one month after everything? Or will it be one of those cases where you don't even drive down the street? Okay, what is your integrity like? And that's that's what makes real estate difficult. If you haven't been a consultative seller and you've manipulated people, you can't really go back and you don't get repeat and referral business. And a consultative selling is the key for the for this generation to sustain property. Um, if you're a consultative salesperson, uh, you never manipulate, you never lie, and you always deal in the facts. Your, your opinions and your gut feels don't really matter. They they just to steer you to ask more questions and of course you come back to the facts. Is worth more in the long term than the sale itself. So yes, your seller didn't give up the JoJo, or yes, he gave up the JoJo. Um, it doesn't really matter. Those were the facts. You relay the facts to the business. Right. And then, of course, I want to come to um, probably the most important part for you as an agent, and that is your commission. And I and I and I I don't um, brag the content that I created. This I've I've been an advocate of this for years. Uh, Jan Mayberg, one of our trainers from Platinum in the southern suburbs, a great trainer, he came up with this term commissionectomy. Uh, for those of you that know what a vasectomy is, you know it's not a it's not great to, to have that done. Um, so a commissionectomy is is cutting your commission. And I've got and uh, there's seven ways that you can avoid cutting your commission. And actually, as I was pondering on this morning, um, the penny the penny dropped a long time ago, but today it became more real because I'm having to it with you so I had to I had to make sure that I absolutely understand and agree with this 
So we cut out commissions for a number of reasons. And let me tell you firstly about commission. Commissions must be tied to a measurable and quantifiable service. Dave, this is so important that this is the message you give out all the time. Commission must be tied to a measurable and quantifiable service, such as a written marketing plan. And this is what you're trading for a commission fee. You know, that's why your open mandates by lead homes are so difficult because you don't, you don't have the time to do a marketing plan for the seller. And you don't then, because you don't have a marketing plan, it's very hard to give feedback. And then when you sell the house, luckily or unluckily, um, you end up getting a low commission because the, the seller is unable to quantify why he should pay you. Okay, so um, commissions must be tied. And that's why I showed you, you've got your, um, your listing presentation. Within that listing presentation is your value proposition. Mr. Seller, if you use us today under an exclusive mandate, we will do the following for you. We will do drone footage. We will do a matterport. We will do a walkthrough video. We will home stage you on, 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 on the featured ad on, on private property. We will have you on Property24. You will go onto our website. We will throw the net so big because we need to get so many fish in to be able to see your property. And then from those fish, we need to get someone to bite for your property. You need to be selling the value of what you give. And because we, we often just go in and sometimes we just close without even sharing the value proposition because we either got lucky. I say it's unlucky. To get, a, to get a mandate before you've actually shown your value proposition because unlucky for you, when it comes to the sale eventually, uh, your, your client's not going to see the value that he needs to pay you. So your commission must always be tied. And that's why we do a written marketing plan. We have something at Harcourt called the Harcourt Promise where I promise to give them feedback after every interview. I promise uh, to, to work within the range of the, of the prices that we agree. And I promise, uh, so there, there are about five different promises, in the, but the most important one, you what, what I've said I will do, and, and, we, and we tick off the different boxes, and then I will give feedback. And feedback is that guarantee that the client knows you're working for him. That's why even if, it's, even if you have nobody for the week, you need to give feedback. The client needs to know that you've got his back. He wants to carry on with his life. He wants to carry on working. He doesn't want to be thinking about his property. What did that buyer say? What was the show house like? What did the ads produce this week? Because the feedback allows you also to see all the time if the market's responding and do I need to make price adjustments. The hardest price adjustment to make, I want to say that again, if you want to bring a buyer, a seller down in price and you haven't given him feedback as to nobody's coming, had no hits on the website and, and, there's, and there's seven other competitors ahead of us. If you don't give him that feedback, it's impossible to convince him to drop his price. Or to lower his price, or to find that, or, or to find that ideal spot. Okay, number two, you sell a marketing strategy to a seller, and he pays you for your services. Ladies and gentlemen, as an estate agent, uh, you are a marketer. Your company, you represent your company, and your company at the end of the day is a marketing company. If you did ads for Bud Light, uh, which is we know was a disaster, you were paid for bringing that ad. If you do ads for Bocomo, a marketing company will do that; they get paid. You do ads and a marketing strategy, a written marketing plan for your customer. That is your value proposition. What, how you close, how you open, how you prospect, all those things are on the side. Okay. In the day, you need to be able to sell your marketing plan. You'll get paid. For it. Number three, a written marketing plan and a calendar guarantee accountability. The calendar is to say, Mr. Seller, I'm going to be doing this on the first when we list. On the third, this is what's going to happen. On the fifth, it's going to happen. And we're going to do this for the next 21 days. So 21 days, we're going to have a review meeting. If we haven't got a sale in 21 days, Mr. Sela, I'm going to come back to talk and talk to you about a, a new strategy, which is going to possibly look at adjusting your price. But this is my calendar. So what does he see? He sees a written plan. He sees a calendar. He knows that you're accountable. On that calendar, you're going to give him feedback every Friday or every Monday. And, and this removes any doubts or fears that the seller may have about paying you for your services. In fact, if you stick to the plan, the sellers will feel obliged to pay you. And ladies and gentlemen, that's, that's the crux of your commission. We're not being paid because we're not demonstrating value. And we may not be demonstrating value because we didn't know we, we had to demonstrate value. Today, you know. Or alternatively, you don't really have a value proposition. You're just like many of the companies out there that's just trying to sell, but without trying to sell by adding value. So if you can prove your value through a written marketing plan, a calendar, remaining accountable and con in your feedback, even to the place where you might even be a pain. That's what's going to sign your commission check. 
Number three, to ensure you get paid, you must first believe your worth as a service provider and, and as a specialist, never cut their fees. You're never going to go to a doctor or a brain specialist and ask them to cut their fees because there's so many of them available out there. A specialist does not cut his fees, but you first got to believe in your worth. You're going to know that I've spent so much money becoming compliant. I spent so much money on marketing. I spent so many years in the field. I am worth my commission. Okay, you must believe first in your worth. Number four, never discuss commission unless you have first qualified what you will do for them. And that's why that process that I gave you, that listing presentation, first takes you through the market condition. Well, firstly, them, what are their needs, that grow model, then the marketing conditions that may affect the price, then the alternative ways to price, and, and then all the marketing that what you do. That's why I said to you yesterday, if someone tries to trap you by what's your commission, um, you, you, you have to get through the process of showing what you would because if you're telling what your commission is, you've already lost him because his perception is very different to you. But if you can build a case, a value case, Mr. Seller, this is what our company can do for you. When you get to the end and you say, Mr. Seller, this is what we're going to do for you to sell your property. These are the different structures. I would recommend the 5.5 commission for you because that throws in the extra matter port, it throws in a drone, um, and it gives you a, a show house every week. I think this is most suited for you, but however, you need, you need to choose. And then you go quiet and you let him look. Now remember, he's, he's now looking at the commission just to see if, if of all those things that he needs at 5.5 versus 5% are relevant or versus 6.5%. You're looking to see if they're relevant. He's not questioning your, your commission. You think he's, commi he's, he's, he's checking your commission once you bring it down. That is not the case. Now, there are scenarios where a guy's going to try and do things to you. This is not the platform for it. But it's safe to say you give him the option to choose his packages. 5, 5.5, 6.5, or 7.5 on an auction, whatever your packages are. And he must choose. And at that point, you go quiet, ladies and gentlemen. You do not make the decision, interject, or talk. Let him process it. You don't have to tell him what to do. He's an adult. Right. So that's why I say you never discuss your commission until you first qualified uh, what you will do for them. Provide proof of differentiation. Okay, that's why it's very easy for us as Harcourts here in the northern suburbs to compete with the with the small little mom and pop shops. Our value propositions are just out of this course. So yes, they charge three percent. You know what happens? They still use Harcourts at five and a half and six and a half percent. At the end of that, they want their property sold. And when we bring them, when we bring them a fair market, irrelevant whether they paid three percent or six or six percent because their property sold. When you provide a strategy and service that leads to a successful sale, you are now entitled to be paid. So let me read that again. Number five, when you provide a strategy, so that's your job, you need listing, and then you provide the service in relation to your listing, that and, and it leads to a successful sale, you are entitled to be paid. And that commission must always be agreed to up front. I always say number six, never cut commission once you've agreed on a percentage. The worst thing you can ever say is, let's start at six percent and let's see what you get, and then and then we can maybe reduce it. That is a is a is a terrible thing to say to your seller because that's all he remembers when you leave. He's thinking about when the price comes, he's going to be able to cut it. Now you work really hard, you bring him a top dollar, and he still wants to keep cut your commission. It doesn't matter if you sell it in one day, one week, one month, or six or, or six months later. Your great commission is your great commission. If you've got um, the written plan, the calendar to substantiate what you've done, you're entitled to your commission. So if he wants you to cut your commission, you just say no. And then what do you do? Okay, let him process the fact that you say no. And ladies and gentlemen, we've got to start standing up for our commission. You believe in your worth. You and you're worth five percent. You're worth five percent. If you worth, believe you're worth seven percent, then you've got to provide a service that's worth seven percent. If you if you're working on three percent. You need to know that you that, that you're only giving three percent value, but it doesn't help you giving five percent value and you're working at three percent. Then you don't know your worth. And so I, I'm I'm being tough on you now because I because I know you work hard and I know you work under pressure. Um, the thing is, can you justify that? Can you quantify that? Can you convince the client that you've done all those things? And number seven, the very very last one for for our session: commission negotiations must be agreed upon and signed before providing your value services. Never leave this to the end. You know, some of you are saying this, we'll, we'll see what price we get. Terrible, terrible strategy. The seller's unsure, you're unsure. Um, and it comes to the final, and when it comes to that final day, you are going to have to cut commission because you never agreed. And now, and now you're over the barrel because you've got an offer. You're desperate. He's desperate. 
and he's going to cut your commission. Right. Uh, just out of interest, we've interviewed a number of sellers. Sellers hate to cut commission. Sellers hate this as much as you do. So stop doing it. Stop Stop leaving commissions out. Stop um, promising to cut commissions at the end. It makes it awkward for you and it makes it awkward for your seller. But ladies and gentlemen, to, to, to point, just to summarize the commission thing is, do you know your worth? Can you, can you substantiate that worth? Are you doing everything that you can to possibly sell this house with all the resources that David and your companies are paying for you? Because it's not free. Nothing at the back office is free. You ask David what it costs to keep a team and to keep those ads going for private property and property for. They pay those for those, those slots regardless of whether you use them or not. So there's, there's a real cost behind the scene. At the end of the day, whatever commission you charge, you're probably going to get half or just over half of what you charge. So, so again, if you're at a 5%, you're actually getting 2.5%. If you're 6%, you're only getting 3.5%. Can you live on 3.5% for two or three transactions a year? Or should you be asking 5% and doing 10 transactions a year? You have to make that decision. And it comes to, do I know my worth? And what is my value package? And as I said, at the end of the day, your seller will pay you the commission that you've agreed up front if you, if you make it worth his while going what you And that is really my take on commission. It's not about what to say, how to counter, how to meet me halfway. I don't want to deal with that. Great value, and you'll get paid for that value. Believe in the value that you, that, that you think you're worth, and that's what you're going to get paid. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to end with my final slide, which is, the preamble for everything that we've done over these last three days, and that is the only obstacle you have to overcome from now on is really fear. Remember, it's only temporary. Don't have regrets. Never let fear decide your future. And everything that you've ever wanted is sitting on the other side, on the other side of fear. In order to be successful, you've got to subdue those fears, and you've got to go and do the hard jobs. We've got six different pictures over the last three days of what you need to do as an agent. You understand your roles, you understand your responsibilities now. And you've just got to go out and do it and be successful and grow and never, never, never cut your commission and never, never, never stop learning. I thank you for your time. It was a privilege spending time with you guys. I know there's a lot of detail and I'm just so glad I could cover so much. And maybe when we meet again, uh, we can break these down into smaller chunks. But I believe you've been given six keys that are going to make you better, stronger, more profitable. Thank you, guys. Thanks, Lee. Um, that's, that's awesome. Um, well done for lasting this long and um, you know, your energy until the very end. Really appreciate it. I've been in sales and sales management for close to 30, uh, over 30 years. Uh, and uh, these, uh, uh, these facts, th these kind of principles don't, don't change much. And I really do appreciate how the fact is that Lee has really focused on the key, key issues um which which is really important um and i think there's a lot of as we as we, as you said before there's a lot of details which um was well, a lot of things that have been said that there's a lot of context behind um but he's really come to the core issues um and taken away the fluff so well done lee thank you so much um guys any before we close off uh, i just want to finish off for a few minutes on on something but um let's any any questions comments um that we have for lee are we in the, especially in this last session? Okay, I'll go to say that I really especially like that last slide about the commission because now I feel more confident about fighting for my commission and not giving in when someone says, um, what is the discount? And then I would say, okay, I'll get back to you, I'll ask, but now I'll just say no. Yeah, Absolutely, that? Crystal. And, and again, if you can prove it and justify it, you're entitled to it. That's that's the only time in my career I'm going to say that's where you must become entitled. Is you is, yeah. is you, you you've earned it. Thank and you. We are, yeah, we are professionals. Um, yeah. Uh, what other uh, well done, Crystal? Uh, good good question. Uh, good comment. Um, what else, guys? Any other comments? Questions? Okay. Clinton, go Dave, ahead. I think, I think what I'm going to give you, Dave, just um, while I've got a moment here, is I'm going to, I'm going to send out two sets of um, documents to you. I'm going to send out the, the framework for all the agents, and I'm going to send the details to you. I'll also give them details. But so, you know, over the next couple of days, there's Crystal. 
Crystal, today I can see the penny drop for you. Over the next couple of days, as you reflect on this, you're going to get more and more pennies drop, and you're going to and you're going to suddenly realize you you are convinced that this is the right road to do. That your next appointment is going to be very very different. And so I'll, I, I think it's only fair that because there's so much detail, Dave, I give them at least uh, all all the prompts that that we've been dealing with over the couple of days, and then I'll give you the details that you can unpack that over time. That you can so there's continuity between the training and their futures. Yeah, fantastic, good. Um, Clinton, go ahead. I just wanted to thank um, David uh, very much, as well as Lee and Usha, Ulrich, and all the other contributors, and then also the other agents that uh, you know pose pose their questions. Uh, really, that's been a lot of lot of learning, and yeah, from here, it's just taking it one step at a time and, and start implementing, uh, and digesting, and then implementing. So I'm look, really looking forward to the next next uh, next while. So thank you very much. Fantastic. And thank you for all your good questions. And uh, yeah, all, all the best. I, I know that you, you're thinking differently already. I can hear it. So go, go out and make money with that new thinking. Yeah, awesome. Uh, any other comments, guys? Comments, questions? Okay, great. Um, please. Hi, David. Go ahead. Hi, yeah. uh, for me, uh, thank you for the session, Lee, and for organizing it for us, David. Uh, my question was just to this last session with the commission. So in essence, Lee, are you saying that once we've presented um, our commission and we might have a potential seller who wants to maybe lower the price because his property is not selling, we haven't positioned him well, um, we can say, oh, you positioned him in a good position, maybe five or four, but now uh, over time, his new property is coming on the market and he wants to maybe change his percentage because now he's seeing he has to lower his position again. Can we be adamant and you know strict with it and say, no, um, it's all part and parcel of what we provide as a service. I can't lower my permission and because the service I'm giving is still top notch and unfortunately the market is determining the prices so if you have to lower yes. your position that's yeah yes um you, you you understand correctly so we don't we don't we don't lower our price because the market changes we there we there to facilitate a process regardless of the market conditions and let me tell you the next couple of weeks next couple of months is going to be tough on sellers but, but why would we want to cut commission because the market's going tough? We didn't create it, but we're going to get them out of that problem by helping them sell their house. So yes, again, if you can if you can show and substantiate your value, um, the client should not, or very rarely, will they question your commission. The other thing is, as prices change, especially as we go into a new interest rate season, prices, um, homes that have been on the market that haven't sold yet are basically going to become stagnant. So there's a massive price adjustment that has to happen across the board. Um, by, by staying in touch with your, your properties on a weekly basis and at least every two weeks, you'll be able to quickly see what competitors are entering and where's your position. So as important as the, as the position is to your seller, it should be just as important to you. And that's, and, and that's where you really add value because everyone else is hoping to get lucky. These lead homes companies, they don't even look at what's happening to that house. They're just chasing the numbers, the volumes, and hoping to get lucky. You don't have that opportunity to work on volume, so you've got to so you've got to work on quality, and that quality starts with you as a service provider giving proper real time feedback. And again, if you do that, uh, Lebohan, you won't your client won't question your your commission, and if he does, you just say no because you've earned it. Okay, I see. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks, Lebo. Any other comments, questions, guys? Um, okay, guys. So, um, Lee, I'm not going to be. I'm not going to be long before I have a final a close. Um, so, key thing, guys, um, on the the massive amount of incredible information we've got over the last three days is is the implementation thereof. So we can feel good um, that we've got a whole lot of information. The um, but that feeling good about the fact that we gain knowledge uh, is not that useful unless we're implementing it. So um, this this is how I plan to just take us to the next step. Uh, number one, the chorus team, we will go through this in our in our weekly Mondays and Wednesday trainings. 
and, and we'll work through the content uh, and uh, on, on a much slower basis. Um, and then also on the one-on-ones with many of you, we will, we will go through, um, and the coaching with some of your group, but the groups, we will go through, especially starting with that, um, that deal making and that, that what do you call it, the goal sheet um, that, that Lee mentioned in the beginning. From a Meraki perspective, um, I know that uh, Carmen is working with, the two, with her team, and that's great. And in all the, um, what I'm prepared to do, um, the, those agents that aren't in the chorus of Meraki teams, uh, I really do appreciate you coming and joining us uh, and uh, investing three days of your time. Um, so what I'm willing to do and what I would like to do is over the next week or two is meet with two or three of you at a time uh, and then um, no obligation, uh, no commitment, you know, no, no, the, the, only, the only thing from our side is to, is to assist, to really do that first step in your journey going forward is it, as we have a commitment to, to, let's say, do that goal sheet together, um, at least I can get you momentum as you, as you start um, managing yourself going forward. So I'd love to uh, offer that to, uh, to, to those uh, non-chorus and Meraki team members. Um, and I will be in touch over the next couple of days to, to find out if you're interested or not. Um, and that's, that's free from our side. So just because I'm really committed to seeing those that join our, uh, join our training or join our sessions, that they can move forward uh, in, their own, uh, in their own businesses. So I'd love to do that. Um, so yeah, um, I, th I think um, I think I think that's it from to close it from from our side, um, from from a from a chorus perspective or from um, from my perspective, Lee. I just want to once again thank you for your uh, your time and commitment. Thank you for shared knowledge. I, I've, I've been um, I, I really had high expectations, um, super high expectations, but um, they were even um, even those were blown away. Um, just incredibly practical. Um, and I really want to appreciate the deep level of knowledge and wisdom that you've got, um, not only what you've said, but at the heart of behind what you're saying and the context in which you're saying you, that you got to these kind of conclusions that you shared with us. So thank you so much. Really appreciate it. I also want to thank once again GSM for, um, for sponsoring this event and um, also for um, Uber, Usha from Uber joining us yesterday as well. And once again, thank you for each one of you for joining us um, and for... Uh, and for you know, and for committing yourselves to these uh, three days, uh, and we've got lots of unpacking to do over the coming months. Uh, any last words, Lee, from your side? So, guys, again, thank you for your time over the three days. I do believe that these six hours that you spent with myself and David, uh, and Dave, thank you for the opportunity. Um, I really have a heart for the industry. I really want to find a couple of shortcuts and key things that will make a difference to agents. This is really my message is that real estate is not as difficult as you think, but if you've got the right tools, the right mindset, and as David said very clearly now, if you if you prepare to take those mindsets and put them to action, that's where you're going to start making money. So there's a lot to unpack, and I think I've given Dave enough um, sales meeting material for a year, and you can unpack them sort of in, in pieces. But uh, again, a, a great privilege to just to share knowledge, share experience, um, with the hope that every one of you will, will go to a next and higher level in your sales career, that you'll prosper in this difficult season that we have in South Africa. But as I often say to agents, we in the most incredible industry because people always need us, whether it's tough, whether there's tanks on the street or whether there's um, uh, what just food in the streets, the uh, property will always sell. We, 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 we position for any single market as long as we can keep adding value and it's that value that people will pay us for. The, the only reason we don't get the comments we do is because we don't truly believe in ourselves and we don't believe in, in our offerings and that needs to change. And I hope that changes today that you can all go home and take home gifts and money. And as I said, within 10 years, every agent should have a paid up house, two investment properties, paid up cars. And that's, and that's the world I want to see agents living in, not, not, not uh, struggling, but thriving. Bless you guys. Thank you again, Dave. Thank you. Thank you to GSM uh, for the sponsorship. And, and I hope to talk to you guys again in the future. It was great. Thank you. Um, thanks, guys. I appreciate it. And uh, we'll see you all soon. Um, yeah. And uh, thanks for your messages. Um, yeah. Um, always be closing deals for Carmen. That's great. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, absolutely. Never stop learning. Um, Okay, cool. Um, okay, great, guys. Well, thanks very much. And whenever you're ready, you can you can move on. And um, don't forget to 
please put those those coaches and mentors around yourself to to keep you uh, accountable um and uh, keep to keep your standards up okay thanks guys thank you pleasure thank you Dave, can you hear me? Yes, Lee. Hi, Dave. Okay, yeah. so, yeah, gosh, that was uh, that, that felt a bit of like a sprint over three days. Yeah, yeah. Um, what, sure. what, I, what I could ask for you for just a few things. Um, I don't know if those comments that are if they're recorded, if I could maybe get a transcript of the of the comments. I just like to use them for future training. Just that uh, Seth said this and um, just help me build a bit of a portfolio there. And then also, if you could give me a review, I'll, I will send you a review sheet and you can also send it to the guys. They can just rate me. It's just five questions. Um, mm -hmm. You know, sometimes people think I go too fast, although we did cram this. We did go fast and we did cram. Um, and then level of content, understanding of the content and relevance of the content. Yeah, look, look at the, the bottom line, Lee. Um, I unashamedly um, put a whole lot of content in. So um, you had no choice, but you move on and move it quite quickly. Um, but then that was part of my plan is to rather bunch a lot of content and then we can unpack later. But um, yeah, and sometimes by um, by flooding ourselves with knowledge, um, it automatically, um, it's like goes from massive gym session, uh, you know, the next day we're at a high level just because we just had so much. Um, yeah. 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 No, I'm very excited. I'm very excited. This is fantastic. I think we hit all the main points um, uh, about, uh, you know, each of the guys building their careers for it. I think beautiful. Beautiful. Yeah. And, and you know, this, this sort of conversation which we're having with the industry didn't exist years ago. Um, I, I don't know many. There is a guy, um, Edwin, yeah, out this way, um, also a super guy. You know, we're starting to have conversations with the industry that, that, that are relevant. You know, I, I look at some of the trainers and, and, and there's some great guys out there, but a lot of them deal with the, with the actual details, which is which a lot of the stuff is 20, 30 years old. And yes, it's yeah. got a place. But the, the agent of today thinks very differently. The agent of today experiences uh, things differently. And in our country today, we've got so many different demographics and so many different cultures and markets. And I think for me, the biggest challenge these three days was, was trying to make it relevant across the cultures, across the industries. Because I, mean, I, don't, I don't know your, your side of the world. You know, Joe, to me, is, is foreign, eh? No, it's fascinating. But I was saying earlier to, um, to the group is that, um, yeah, um, the, there's definitely culture differences between Creole and Sasselberg and, and Kenilworth yes. and Carpentane, but the principles are the same, Lee. The, the principles are the same. I've, I've done it on the rental side of the business. We had separate rental rules the way we ran our business compared to Cape Town. And for many years, it was maybe relevant, but I've actually now tightened up that we are putting the same systems, no matter if you're looking at affordable housing or social housing in Joburg, CBD, and that's a pretty hardcore place to, to your Bishop's Court properties. Um, and, and you, they're literally two ends of the social social spectrum, but but the principles are the same. You got to respect right. people. You got to be a professional. You got to you got to do the basic rules. You got to negotiate correctly. You got to do the professional viewings. People are peopley. That's right. So, That's right. And the bedrock the bedrock is always: Am I compliant? Yeah. Am I following the code of conduct? Am I am I selling with integrity? And am I and I, am I representing my seller and my buyer? Correctly, and and, and no. so those are those are your bedrocks for whatever you're selling. But then, but then, then I do agree that there's some social differences. That the, when you're in Jeppistown, you got to, you got there's certain kind of things as us as kind of middle class whites won't understand, and and we got to be blissfully ignorant about. I'm not saying when you're in that market, you got to learn some some nuances. Um, there's typically <clears> multiple <throat> economies happening in those kind of areas, um, and you lose your innocence very quickly. But but the principles are still the same. I mean, the people in Uzbekistan are just as beautiful as the people in any other any other area. Yeah, fantastic, Dave, and they're all they're, they're, yeah, got the same needs. Yeah, Dave, you know that that card game. Now, I mean, when I do a public one, we hand out cards and we get the guys to place them, and we have a lot of fun. I can see, I can see your guys if if they if they really understand that card game and how to how to just graphically represent a very difficult topic. Um, they're going to have so much fun, and I, I'd love to see. Yeah. I think our Solomon, he's going to. He's going to look like a card dealer when he does it, and I'd love to. I'd love to see how these guys do it in a couple of months' time, because when that penny drops, it changes everything. Yeah, I agree. I mean, see, we're actually having a big ch a challenge in certain markets where I think typically your 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 laziness of the agents 
um, and the sellers are dictating everything. And it's amazing. Yes. The, the, yes. the sellers are dictating everything. This is your price. This is your commission. Take it or leave it. And I'm saying uh, my discussion with the team, um, it's easier said than done. And this is why I think the last two days, three days have been amazing because you need the tools and skills to change the conversation. Just change. Overcome those, to overcome overcome those objections. Yeah. Yes, that's right. And, and, I, and I, believe there's a reason that, I believe there's a reason that the sellers are, are, are now fully entitled and taking initiatives because yeah. the, the standard in our industry is so low yeah. and people simply don't know how to respond. They're just saying yes, sir, no, sir, yeah. and then living with the consequence of them. And, and that can end. Eh? Um, I, I changed that three years ago. I, I started working on these principles, sharing the market stats, getting them to decide, making them responsible. Because for years, I was carrying the burden of not selling, uh, accepting overpricing, and then and then receiving a low commission and it was it was frustrating you know yeah no we're seeing that in certain areas and w w getting the mandates is not the challenge selling those mandates okay some of these areas you wouldn't some of the areas are tough because you, you know they're tough to sell in and, and to buy in uh, especially in certain economies where you've got mining leaving or whatever um but the principles are still the same we need to be dictating to sellers or uh, the the dog must wag the tail not the other way around and what the the, the tail is wagging the dog too much um, but it takes it takes sales skills. This is why you know this is why I think that what we've spoken, of, especially today, yesterday and today, is so important because now we can say, okay, let's use those principles. How would we deal with this seller differently? Yeah, um, yeah. So I'm excited about because it's going to get real tangible benefit. It's too mm -hmm. much. The sellers are dictating what we what we must do, and we're wasting our time. And you know, if, they, if you know if you do that card game, and as I say, I, I've dealt with some top end guys. I, I listed a property for four million and two point two million on that basis, and I had one of my junior agents with me, uh, Linda Bentley. She was amazed how easy it was to close. And when I walked out, I said, to her, "It actually wasn't. I, I, even I was amazed how easy it was to close because when they understand where their property sits in context to the relation of of um, everything else, then it starts to make sense. Yeah. But we've never had a we've never had a vehicle to articulate that." So, so the card game was something that was that it took me months to sort of think it through. But when I and then I picked a group of guys through it, and I, it, it was very confusing. And then we narrowed it down and narrowed it down. Literally, those two slides are the essence of, of how we interpret the markets. And most people are visual, so it's easy to understand. And, and I remember listing two properties: one for just under the four million, because everything else was over four million, and they they made the call to go under four. And then the other property where we were probably a hundred thousand under the normal market value, but the house was shot there. Eh? We had 29 people through in one hour during COVID. Yeah. So it was, it was no, we, it wasn't one hour. Um, and we wrote 16 offers and we eventually put them out to basically by Thursday at four o'clock, we would, we would end up um, uh, 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 taking the highest offer or the most qualified highest offer. And we ended up pushing the, uh, we ended up pushing the price up, but not pushing it. The market was willing to pay about 150,000 more for that property because we created a frenzy because, because, we, because we priced it strategically. And the strategic was, was in first position. Yeah. Everybody looking to go into the Kenridge area saw this as an absolute bargain. The pictures were, were so amazing, but didn't represent the house at all. That was my only uh, bad feedback. But I mean, we ended up creating, because we created market value, sometimes, uh, or, or competitive position, often, if you can get feet through the door because of that competitive position, price will be driven up. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think that's sometimes what you do is need activity. Um, you need activity. You, you need activity. And if you're not even getting activity. Um, but yeah, I mean, look, I've got a, I've got a three point, one of my team members has got a 3.5 million in Santon. There's just zero movement. The, the, the market is so liquid in that suburb. Um, You'll imagine a Santon, but it's just not, you, you know, the average high level person is no longer living in Santon because they don't need to go and work to go to work in Nedbank every day. Um, so how, did he, how did he did he derive the price? That? Say again. Where did that price come from, Dave? No, I mean it's 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 a typical valuation. It's 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 uh, on a valuation perspective, it's worth that. But no, my conversation with an overseas seller now, he's a South African oak that's living overseas. He, you know, he just wants to get rid of it. Just too much hassle. So we, I said to him, like you've either got to go below the three to make it first in queue, or otherwise you're going to keep it yeah. and just keep a tenant in there. But but there's certain sub markets which I think um, are really tough. Uh, but you, but you, if we do this, I think if we, I think this card trick will be amazing in it um, because I haven't used that perspective. perspective. Um, so, there's, so there's your answer. You know, you said initially we saw this, and um, I do believe it needs to be under the three million. He has the evidence to to support my to support my my claim here, and then showing the evidence, and then and then again, you know, the tempting thing is to say, well, we're just going to bring it under the three. 
but you should actually say to them, look, this is the, these are the properties in relation to yours that I was telling against you. This is you want to take and make him make the call. Sometimes you'd be amazed, Dave. You know, when people, depending, we don't know their background. I, I had a, we had a couple here, um, uh, brothers, that had, their, their parents had died. They bought them a house in the security state here in Free London. And the property started off at 4.5 million, priced by Pan Golding. And then, and it, and it didn't sell. It, it had a seller. It was a weird house. It didn't have a garden. It was a sectional title, part of a sectional title development. And my two ladies, Natasha and um, Tanya Devet, ex Pam Golding, went in together with Steve as a joint mandate. And they, they eventually they got him to go to 3.5 million. And still, we got no hits, but we kept on them. The feedback was every Friday. And then one day, I did what we call a Midas touch, which basically I do the card game. And I actually showed them that if you look at Free London, they had two competitors. But if you looked in relation to Durbanville, they had 74 competitors. And then I was mm. quiet in the, in, the, in the same range. Then they could understand that it wasn't us that were, were, were bad agents. It was the market didn't simply yeah. see it. It was an outlier. You know, we eventually, saw, we, eventually got them, we eventually got them to agree to 2.9. And you know what offer? We took 2.7 million, 4.5 yeah. expectation. 2.7 million. You know what happened? They wanted to get rid of the house. They were financially strained in Joburg. Um, this house was costing them 10,000 rand a month in levies. So, so often we project our feelings or our assumptions into the, that, that the client won't accept it if it's so low. There we saw, that was, that was a record breaking moment for us as a company to realize that. And, we, and by the way, we've got full comp. I said to the guys, when we close it, I said, and, and just, just remind you that the work we've done, the level we've done still remains at 5.5. And you know what? I was quiet. And they said, you know, that, and that's fine. The two brothers agreed we were on a Skype like you and I. And they agreed. And there, was, and there was a moment for all of us to realize that we mustn't project our own assumptions. Show them the market. Show them the competitors. Let them decide. And then when you bring them an offer, again, you show them the competitors. There were still 74 competitors. He didn't stand a chance. Someone was willing to pay 2.8. And wow, we, we closed it with full commission. Yeah, I think, I, I think it's, yeah, it's a very good moment. And said to, to look, I think um, I was talking to my cousin who sold his house in Joburg on West Joburg, um, and he was very competitive. His house was very competitive in his particular suburb, but the market was actually was actually comparing him with across the spread. And across the spread, he was uncompetitive, so he had to drop his price because of the way the market was looking at the area as opposed to yes. what it's interesting, actually, yeah. especially in yeah. a in a market which in Joburg, which is a, a depreciating market. Um, and a good, so, a good agent yeah. needs to read those signs all the time, all those signs, give feedback. It doesn't matter if it hurts the, if it hurts the seller, give feedback, positive feedback, negative feedback. Um, because yeah. at the end of the day, someone's going to sell it and you want it to be you. Yeah, yeah. no, I agree. I think, I think we've got some great team members who are very active and uh, we're going to have lots of fun, um, you know, you having these conversations because I've been, we've got 110, you know, you know, we, we, out of 15 agents, we had 100, we've got 110 mandates. Uh, in the business, we don't have a mandate problem. We have a seller, pro uh, a buyer problem. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's a selling problem. It's it's not a oh. you know actually getting mandates, which is cool. But we're not you know if we're selling. I was actually my daughter was saying how this whole business works and all this kind of stuff. So I was explaining to her so she get all this commission. I said, well, we're only selling. Let's say we sell one out of ten properties. You know, no wonder the commission like it is. Okay, well, some yeah. of the guys are selling much higher than much higher percentages than that, but but it just shows. And this is my biggest challenge is how do we get this mandates to a better quality? And I think, I think, um, um, I think, I think us starting at a better point where we're not getting on those mandates. Well, we're getting those mandates on at a much better value. I think what we're, uh, this, and this is why I think this, the last two days have been so critical for some of our team members to really, it's not that they can't sell and they're not getting mandates. They're awesome at that. They um, just don't have all, all perspectives yet. Yeah, which is awesome. Yeah, it's fantastic. Um, yeah, I'm looking forward to it. It's going to be great. Um, I look forward to your notes. And I'll, of course, I will give you feedback. I've, I've screenshotted some of these comments. I will also get some of them on the recordings. Um, and um, I will send them to you. And you, um, it's been a pleasure. And then I have no problem um, also spreading uh, the love on, on Monopoly uh, to as many people as I know, which I will continue to do. And um, and I, I have checked with EXP what they what what the, what the offerings they've got. I do think they've got as much as they have some excellent stuff. Um, I, I'm going to have to complement it with with what what I provide. Um, yes. A lot of it is contextual. What is what is contextual at where each of the team members are at at any one time? Yes. Um, which is yes. exciting. Yeah. 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 Cool. Uh, Lee, I'm going to go. Um, back to chat. Um, and um, thank you. Um, and enjoy the rest of the rainy Cape Town. Day. No, thanks. Yeah, we, you also got rain. I take it on your side, eh? On the mountain, yeah, it always yeah. rains by you. 
Yeah, big time. Oh yeah. We lucky. We lucky if our JoJo's fill up here. You guys have cool JoJo's. Yeah, yeah, no, <laughs> sure. I know. I'm, 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 I don't have. I'm renting a property. So I don't have a JoJo yet, but yeah. All right, Dave. Awesome. Thank thanks. You. And thanks again for Thank the exposure. Me. Thanks. Bye. Thanks, Bye. thanks for giving me Bye. the practice. Different. Yeah, you're brilliant. Thanks, eh? Thanks, mate.